All right, thanks for watching. And today I not only want to give you an overview of Darbu integration, but also I want to show you why we care so much about uniform continuity. So two things today because I'm cool like that. Now, as usual, the goal is to find the area under a function. So just to simplify, suppose I give you a function f from 0, 1 to r. And very important, I do not assume yet that f is continuous. And again, the goal is, as usual, find the area under the graph of f and over the interval 0, 1. Now, the approach is almost exactly the same as for Riemann integrals. And in fact, one can show that Darbu integration is equivalent to Riemann integration. So technically, I'm not teaching you anything new, but it will look new, trust me. So just like for Riemann integrals, what you want to do, you want to subdivide 0, 1 into n rectangles of width 1 over n. So suppose you chop this up into rectangles of width 1 over n. So the first point here is 1 over n, then 2 over n, dot, 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 up to n over n. By the way, I'm doing a simplification here because technically for Darbu integrals, you, the width of the rectangles aren't always the same, but you basically require that the width, the largest width of the rectangle be 1 over n. So that's what's called a mesh, where again, the um, rectangles don't always have the same size. Now. Uh, Here's the main difference between Riemann integrals and Darbu integrals. Because before for Riemann, you just say, choose the left point or the right point, but sometimes also an arbitrary point. But here for Darbu, if you're in the rectangle i over n, or uh, let's say, uh, yeah, i over n and i plus 1 over n, and you have your function like that, for the Darbu integral, what you do, you choose the biggest point of f and the smallest point of f. So here, in this rectangle, the biggest point is here. And you just choose the rectangle with, with this height. And this height, ironically, even though uh, it, it's not the minimum, we denote it as min. Okay. So in other words, it's m as the maximum in the ith rectangle of width 1 over n. And similarly, you choose the minimum, which is here, coincidentally, and this we call it little m i n. Okay. I should have just called it the Mickey and the Mini because maximum and minimum, but I guess not. <laughs> okay. So just to make this precise, so let um, m i n be the supremum of f of x, where x is in uh, i uh, over n, i plus 1 over n, and a uh, little m i n be the infimum of f of x over the same rectangle. Okay. Now, of course, it might be infinity or minus infinity, but here's the thing. First of all, we assume f is non-negative, so this infimum is at, at least zero, and also we can assume f is bounded, and in fact, very soon we'll assume f is continuous. So, in fact, all those numbers are finite. And now here's the important thing. Because remember, our goal is to estimate uh, the area under the function. But notice, now, if at each point we'll take the minimum, like here, the smallest value, here I believe is the smallest value here, and then here is the smallest value. Again, it looks like the left endpoints, but now we'll take the right endpoints 
and not always the right endpoints. You see here, for instance, it's the midpoint, roughly. And then here, yes. So this is the smallest rectangles. On the other hand, we'll take the biggest rectangles, which is kind of the opposite here. Something like that. I know it gets very messy, but maybe like this. And notice there's something interesting going on, because what is the area under the function? It's this thing in green. And notice in particular, and this is what makes this work, the area under the function, it's squeezed between the smallest rectangle and the biggest rectangle. So I think here you call it a bound, in French it's called an encadrement. I like that word a lot. And therefore, to make this precise, consider the following two sums, because we want to sum the blue rectangles and the red rectangle. So call ln to be, again, the sum of the areas of the rectangles, but since they all have width 1 over n, that is just 1 over n times the sum from i from 0 to n minus 1. Because you see, we, have, we start from 0, 1, 2, and to have n values, you stop at n minus 1 over n. Because this is the last rectangle. So m i n, kind of the lowest sum, and at u n be the upper sum. i from 0 to n minus 1 of Mickey. Okay. All right, why are those important? Because remember, technically we don't know what the area under the function is, but it turns out those two sequences, which depend on n, have a very nice property. And for this, Consider the following. So now let's see how those two things change if you increase n. And just for you know, uh, an extreme case, assume we only have two rectangles. So you have this function f here. Okay? And you have two rectangles. Okay? And let's calculate u, u2, for instance. Because you know, um, uh, not the band, but the uh, uh, bounds, <laughs> okay? the upper sums. Now, if we have two rectangles, well, the bigger sum looks like this, which is like a very crude overestimate. So this is u2. And let's see now what happens if we choose four rectangles. So maybe here. Let's see what happens to this crude estimate. So we get something here, maybe. Or maybe just the da da da. Okay. This rectangle, and then this rectangle, and then maybe uh, da, 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 okay. so maybe this rectangle, and this rectangle. Well, notice something very interesting is happening, namely u4 is actually smaller than u2, because u2 were those two huge rec rectangles, but u4 is the smaller red rectangles. So in fact, what's nice about this sequence un is that it's actually decreasing. So notice what we have. We have u1 is less than or equal to u2, is less than or equal to u3, is less than or equal to u4, dot, dot, dot. So this sequence is decreasing. But moreover, while the function is non-negative, so it's bounded below by 0. And therefore, we have a decreasing sequence bounded below by zero, monotone sequence theorem. So by the monotone sequence theorem, we actually get that un converges to some number u. And interestingly, with ln, the lower sums, the opposite scenario happens. It's increasing and bounded above, so it converges to another number called l. Similarly, ln is increasing and bounded above. 
again, assuming your function is bounded, and therefore it converges. Ln converges to L. Okay. So again, we have again this area under the function, which we don't know what it is, okay. kind of like this. We have our lower rectangles, okay. which increase, and we have our upper rectangles, which decrease. And it's a horrible picture, but the point is the lower rectangles are increasing, the upper rectangles are decreasing. Oh, maybe they converge to a common limit. Well, if they do, then that limit is the area of the, the function. So this is kind of the, uh, not quite the Darboux criterion, that's something else, but kind of the definition of the integral if that happens. So uh, sort of fact or definition, if those two limits are the same. So if the lower limit is the same as the upper limit, then we call that the integral. So if u equals l, then that common limit is denoted by the integral from 0 to 1 of f of x dx, u, and that's l. And in that case, we call the function integrable. However careful, this is not always true. Because suppose, again, you take this classical example of the function that's 0 at the rationals and 1 at the irrationals, then all the lower sums are 0. So un is 0 for all n, so it converges to 0. But all the upper sums, they're 1. So ln is 1 for all n, and therefore L is 1, and they're not the same. So really, if they go to the same thing, then we call that the integral. And as I said, you can just, uh, it's equivalent to Riemann integration, because uh, at least if f is continuous, then uh, you know, the upper sum and the lower sum, they're not so different to any sum you know, when you choose any number in the rectangle. All right, and in fact, here's what I want to show. So that was the introduction to Darboux integration. And what I want to show now is, in fact, if f is continuous, then this is actually true. So in other words, continuous functions are Darboux integrable. So fact, if uh, f from 0, 1 to r is continuous, then, in fact, u equals l. Or in other words, more precisely, the limit as n goes to infinity of un e minus ln equals 0. And as I said, it's a beautiful proof because a uh, beautiful illustration of uniform continuity because remember, uniform continuity does not see position. The delta that we have works for any x and y where we're at. And that's perfect because in our small rectangles, we don't really know where the maximum and the minimum are at. So that's the main idea. So proof. So let epsilon be given. And the point is, since f is continuous on this compact set, it's uniformly continuous. So since f is continuous on 0, 1, f is uniformly continuous again on that same set. So there is delta positive such that for all x and y, in that interval, okay, if x minus y is less than delta, then f of x minus f of y is less than epsilon. And well, how do we find n from here? Well, we want n basically to be very large, so choose n to be uh, bigger than 1 over uh, delta. So let capital N be bigger than 1 over delta, okay. then 
if um, so yeah um, let me just check yeah uh, then if n is bigger than capital M well then the point is uh, suppose The point is, if n is bigger than capital N, then that width, okay, so if n is very large, the width actually becomes less than delta. So then um, 1 over n is less than 1 over capital N, and that's less than 1 over 1 over delta, so it's less than delta. So the point is, since the width 1 over n is less than delta, if you're in the rectangle, i over n and i plus 1 over n, all the values of f are epsilon close. So in particular, if you take what's called the maximizer, so the point where f has its maximum and the point where f has its minimum, then the difference between those f's is actually epsilon close because uh, remember in that region of size less than delta all the values of f are at most epsilon apart so in particular choose a point xi okay that gives you the maximum and the point yi that gives you the minimum then xi minus yi are less than delta but f of xi and f of yi are less than epsilon. So, so suppose if f of xi is, gives you min and uh, f of yi, again by definition, is the point that gives you the minimum, then the point is xi minus yi, since they're in the same rectangle, they're at most 1 over n apart, but 1 over n is less than delta. So the point is, f of xi minus f of yi is less than epsilon. Is less than epsilon, and that just implies that min minus min is less than epsilon, but remember the maximum is bigger than the minimum, so we get min minus min is less than epsilon. So the point is, on each rectangle, the difference between the maximum and the minimum is very small, and in particular, if you sum it over all the rectangles, you actually get that the difference between the upper sum and the lower sum is also very small. So then, so if n is bigger than capital N, we get that the difference between un and ln, which, by the way, so you, the upper sum is bigger than the lower sum, so that becomes un minus ln. But what is the upper sum again? That's 1 over n times the sum from i from 0 to n minus 1 of the biggest value, so min minus 1 over n, the sum from i from 0 to n minus 1, m i n, but then you can just add them together, so that becomes a 1 over n times the sum from 0 to n minus 1 of m i n, m i n minus m i n, so maximum minus minimum, but we know this is less than epsilon, so what you're doing, you're adding n times the term epsilon. So we actually get 1 over n. So it's less than 1 over n times epsilon, but n times. This cancels out. And at the end, you get your victorious epsilon. Because given epsilon, you can find a threshold capital N which remember this 1 over delta, such that if n is bigger than capital N, 
the difference between the upper sum and the lower sum is actually less than epsilon. And then you're done and you can stay home happy. And again, the main point was um, because, uh, because of uniform continuity, we don't, we don't know and we don't really care where our delta. And the main point was, again, because of uniform continuity, the delta is independent of the position, which is perfect because a priori, we don't know where the uh, maximum and the minimum are. We just know that they're somewhere in this rectangle and that's perfect for uniform continuity. All right, I hope you like this. If you want to see more math, please make sure to subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much.